Neil, how are you on this fine Friday afternoon? I'm good. I got my green tea and uh, not mushroom coffee today. It's been you a while since you shipped out mushroom coffee. I know. It's been a minute too. Yeah, I'm, I'm having some uh, fermented wheat, as, as you might call it. Uh, <laughs> slightly less healthy than green tea, but excellent for a Friday afternoon podcast. Yeah, absolutely. We're very excited to dive into this because we are joined today by Eric Jorgensen, uh, the author of The Almanac of Naval Ravikant, which we discussed in the last episode, if you have not heard it. And we're going to do a follow-up to discuss more topics from the book, hear about how it was made, talk about any other books and things that Eric loves, and uh, just hang out and have a great episode today. So Eric, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. This is a good time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think question that I've just been very curious about, and I'm sure other people are curious about as well, is uh, what inspired you to write a book summarizing Naval's wisdom? Because you you did an excellent, you know, we, we talked about this in the last episode, it's like a lot of summary books like don't end up bringing that much to kind of like the conversation and the knowledge. And you did like such an incredible job bringing all of Naval's wisdom together into one place. And you, you made something really, really special with it that we both really loved. Um, and so I'm just really curious, like what inspired you to do it? Uh, what was the project like? And hear a little bit about that. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. That's, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of hard work in that. <laughs> you know, it's, I think that comes from just I mean, I put in a lot more reps than I expected to, you know, I thought this was going to be a three or six month project and it ended up being a three year project, um, which is both kind of not surprising. And I think where the like polish comes from, you know, I, I really like, um, I gave myself a plenty of time. Like there was no deadline. I just knew that I had to like really, really believe in how good the final product was to feel good, like putting it out there, you know, um, you know, with, my name on it and Naval's name on it. I wanted Naval to be proud of it and excited about it. Um, cause he kind of took a risk on like letting a totally random stranger from the internet, like create a book out of all the stuff that he's said. Um, so you asked him before you started it? Kind of. Yeah. I mean, I just tweeted like a joke one night. Um, it was right after that he did that podcast with, um, Shane Parrish. And I thought that was such a good episode and there's such a like timeless, awesome wisdom in there, like that knowledge project episode. And I listened to it like three times and I, I've been following Naval for 10 years, you know, I was reading venture hacks and stuff back in the day. And so I'd learned a lot from him and I was like, man, this is, this is like, this is book level wisdom that is just like in a podcast. And I feel like it's, it's, more people need it and it needs to be in like a timeless thing and it needs to, um, and so I just tweeted one day a little poll that was like, Hey, if I made, you know, the almanac of Naval Ravikant and put, actually I called it the book of Navalage, I think, and like made it, put it on Kindle for like three bucks. Like, would you guys want that? And, uh, and they like tweeted it at 10 o'clock and like giggled to myself at my pun and went to bed and then Naval retweeted it. And I woke up to find and like, you know, 4,000 people were like, yeah, dude, do this. Um, it, to be fair, like it's Twitter. So 2000 people were also like, shut up, you're dumb. Don't do this. Uh, so, but, but the eyes took it. So, um, I just kind of started working. I Naval replied and was like, Hey, yeah, happy to provide you, you know, whatever materials you need, old tweets, whatever. Um, but cool. there was no you know, preexisting relationship. There's no special access. I just kind of started plugging away at it and had to kind of figure out my vision as I went, you know, I wasn't even sure it was going to be a book at first. It was just trying to do something cool with all this raw material. I was just going to say, I know. And I think Nat, you felt the same way. Like I didn't know a lot of the run up to it. I think I had seen it posted, uh, maybe other people posting about it here and there, but I did, I wasn't like following it for three years. And then when it came out, I had a couple friends who had posted about it and I'll admit, like I was very skeptical, uh, going in, not because of Naval, not because of, I didn't know you at the time. So I had no idea, right. Like what you were all about, but more because like these summary books tend to be like, I was thinking like, Oh, I've been following Naval for years. Like how much am I really going to learn from this? And, mm -hmm. uh, and I even assumed like our audience, I was like, Oh, people would have already known a lot of this stuff. Like what, you know, they probably listened to all the same podcasts. I've listened to those podcasts. Like, am I really going to get much out of it? Then a couple of people who I really, you know, really get, I like their recommendations. They posted that they got a ton of value from it. And I was like, I got to pick this up. So then I bought it and I started reading it. And then I texted Nat and I was like, should we do this next? And I felt kind of weird even saying that. It's like, if Nat hasn't checked out the book, he's going to think like, why are we picking this book? But uh, no, it was awesome. Like I, just to, you know, reiterate what Nat was saying, like it was, it's very rare to find like these, cause it wasn't, 
in my opinion, it wasn't just a summary book, right? Like, because these, all these ideas that are out there, he's put out in so many different places. Um, it, it's never been put together in a like format that's this way where you actually can grasp all the ideas in one place because he is largely on podcasts, I would say is like where he's dropped a lot of, I mean, and Twitter, of Mm -hmm. course, but his knowledge is like not organized, I would say until this book. Uh, and, and I think that that's really what made it amazing. And I think even though I'd heard a lot of those concepts before seeing them organized and like layered on top of each other that way, uh, made them even, you know, much more powerful, I think. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, that's, um, the analogy I use is kind of like, it it was like doing a giant conceptual jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. And like, it's easy to say like, Oh, I've seen all these pieces. Like I recognize these and, um, you know, I totally get where the skepticism comes from. Like the genre is not good, but I just kind of felt like if I put the pieces together in the right way and used only the best pieces, you know, he evolved some of these ideas for five years on different podcasts and different things. And if you take the best articulation of each idea and arrange them all kind of in the right order, you know, a lot of the editing was just finding the right seams between the ideas and stitching them together and then creating like a hierarchy that made sense. And, um, you know, creating like, what felt like a conversation that kept moving and finding the right places where the question was the right follow up. That was a natural kind of follow on idea so that it reads like a conversation that you would have and pulls you through. And I should say like, this is not a summary book in that. Like I didn't write an original word, right? Like I'm not writing about what I think about and of all, I'm not trying to reiterate his ideas. I'm just taking like what he has already said and trying to reorganize it into like the very tightest most helpful kind of like version that you can imagine of all the stuff that he's done for 10 years. Right. And then I've learned from him. And am I right that you kind of like scrapped a lot of it and went back to the drawing board, like four times, I want to say. Or oh yeah. Somewhere? Yeah. Yeah. At least like I thought I had a done manuscript in like 2018 or something. And oh, I was wow. like, wow. I was like, I got this. <laughs> and I was like, You know, you put it down for a minute and you're like, this isn't right. This isn't good enough. Um, You know, and and trying to figure out, like, it wasn't clear to me at first, like whether I should be writing and stitching ideas together and like explaining what some of these things were. Um, And so that was a big decision. And, um, you know, figuring out what what format it should even be. Like Trevor McKendrick, finally, I was kind of like feeling confused and Trevor McKendrick just like verbally slapped me. It was like, don't overthink it. It's a book. Just do it. Just like get back to it. It's a book. (laughs) I was like, okay, I got it. I got it. it." Um, and that's Trevor, yeah. the chief of staff at Lambda School, right? For anyone. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. He's got an awesome newsletter. Um, yeah. He's, he's a great writer uh, as well. So yeah, he um, he was a very helpful kind of like sounding board for that. And yeah, I mean, I, I, the original version of this, like there was one manuscript that was just like shitty organization. And then there was one that was like 600 pages that was just like totally like the poor Charlie's almanac approach. It's like, here's everything. Um, yep. and I gave that to some people to read and they were like, I got kind of tired, like maybe halfway through. Cause like, I'm not that interested in crypto or like, I'm really interested in crypto and all this stuff is already two years old. I'm like, okay, cool. Um, so I just really kept honing it down until it was like the stuff that was only universally applicable, evergreen ideas. Um, and then another kind of passive reorganization and yeah, I just, just trying to kind of keep sanding away corners until it feels, you know, to you power through the end. And, you know, people who say like, I'm highlighting every page or like I read it in one sitting is like, that's exactly what I was going for. That's, um, those kind of notes feel awesome. And I'm really glad that that's, you know, the bar that we reached. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's only, it's been out for three months and you've got like 800 reviews on Amazon, which is pretty incredible. Amazing. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like what, what has reception been like? What has your life been like the last three months since it came out? Yeah. It's, um, the reception has been awesome. I mean, I didn't, um, on the one hand, I knew there was like enough fans of Naval to kind of like give it a try. Um, but the really, for me, the, like, you know, the KPI I gave myself was like long tail relevance and, highlight density. Um, mm-hmm. so like the guys at Readwise will, will pull highlight data in another like month or two here and tell me like, I really want to rank on the all time kind of like highlight density scoreboard. Um, yeah, yeah. Which I think that's is a, a cool great way like, to think about it. Yeah. That, that's the way I think about which books are my favorites is like, I can just look at my bookshelf and I can look at a book and see the highlight density. And I know, right. If it's, do they good. post and, that publicly? Like I don't think they, do. have, I, they should, that's an awesome idea to them before. It would that be is an awesome idea. Share. Yeah. yeah. Amazon does. Amazon shares that data. Hmm. Uh, or at least they used to. 
because well and amazon has like that popular highlights thing right like is that what they're popular highlights that's probably where they're pulling that from partially yeah Yeah. because that's an interesting way to filter like what to read also absolutely we we need a Jamie to Google stuff for us while we're. <laughs> well, we, we, we've had that. Uh, yeah, we we just do a we, live while we're talking. <laughs> yeah, we just uh, and then every time we say we need our own Jamie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's good. Accidentally um, keep the joke going. Perfect. It yep. looks like they've used it for articles and stuff, but they haven't. They don't have like a running list on their site. I really think the Readwise guys should do it because that they would be absolutely should. Yeah, great, mm-hmm. great data to see. Yeah, and I think their audience probably or like their customer base skews uh, to be similar readers to to us. I'm yeah. guessing so if they have like a leaderboard, I'm guessing they're like you know top hundred books would all be interesting. Yeah. Good. Uh, the other thing yeah. that I'd be really interested in seeing is some way of measuring highlight density can see through a book because mm-hmm. yeah, I know oh, there's yeah. a lot of oh, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of books that I read where I highlight a first like quarter or third where they do like the meat of it and then you can tell the next two thirds is like just fluff that the publisher made them add so it'd be cool to see like some measure of like highlight consistency because yeah like Navalmanac I've got just very consistent dense highlights all the way through but uh, I was reading like debt the first 5,000 years which is an excellent first third and then it just kind of like I, at mm. least for me it felt like it, it fell off after that so it's kind of funny to see uh that as well that would be cool like a visual way to to see like the highlight density like you know the first chapter or e- by chapter maybe even you could like, even pick which part of the book to read first based on the highlight yeah. density. it's like oh everybody loves this chapter but you know it's getting as much here like i i won't feel bad skipping it <laughs> yeah oh well, that was something so, i got from from uh Navalmanek, actually was yeah yeah that it, it reminded me of that yeah exactly that reminded me i know he had tweeted this before and he's probably retweeted it a bunch of times but it, i kind of gave myself permission again to just quit books in the middle mm-hmm. uh if i wasn't getting much from them or if i felt like i already got everything i'm gonna get out of this book like there's always that fear of missing out. Like, Oh, maybe the next chapter is going to have some, like this little tidbit, but like really at the end of the day, it's probably not going to be anything that changes your life, even if it's good. Uh, and it might just be entertainment. So it's like, okay, maybe I can move on to the next one. Um, and I've been really bad at doing that throughout like my reading life. I would say is I just, I'll be like, Oh, I'm reading this. I got to power through. And yeah. there's so many books out there that, you know, you're not going to get a chance to read them all. Even if you use his strategy of quitting books midway, if you're kind of, or, or skipping around, um, yeah, that's, that's so, what I finally started doing with some of these giant biographies is like I realized mm-hmm. like the first chapter is all their like prior generations family chapters like two through five are like their kind of like, you know, childhood through age 30. And then like I, I, the other part is just like not relevant to me yet. Um, so I just like, read like the three. First <laughs> yeah. yeah, I skip the first <laughs> chapter and then like the rest of the first third of the book and then just like put it down and like, you I know. like that. That's a good strategy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, I'll still stick with it if I'm like being entertained, but yeah, there's like some books that are like more, uh, you know, you're reading to like gain some knowledge about something and hopefully you're being entertained and gaining knowledge. But, um, yeah, a lot of biographies you're spot on They're They're exactly like that. One, one big exception is, uh, I don't know if either of you've read it. Um, the William Manchester Churchill three part. You biography. love that series. <laughs> that series is incredible. I, I mean, I spent like two years reading it. So it's yeah, also yeah. sunk cost. There's also like a sunk cost fallacy probably going on here. That's always uh, my question too. That's but how it's I feel straight about up, power broker. <laughs> so, I, so I haven't picked that up for that exact reason yet. And I'm like, I know once I start that one, if it's, if it's written well, that's what I'm going to be reading that year. So, <laughs> yep. <laughs> so that's what that, I wonder uh, about like, yeah. uh, like infinite jest too. It's like, did I actually like that book or is beat ourselves into finishing <laughs> yeah <laughs> now that one uh, yeah that one is i'm still hit or miss if somebody asks like should i read infinite jess i'm like well it's a good book but if that's all you want to read for a while <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah or you can just listen to the podcast it's good too one of the episodes so eric when you were working on the book then how naval's wisdom and what of naval's wisdom do you feel like you incorporated into your life like what what resonated most with you and have you kind of like carried forward, especially now that the project's done? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, it it was definitely reaffirming of some ideas that I kind of already had. Right. So like builder by equity in a business is like a great articulation of, Mm. you know, kind of my, my plan already was just like, I'm never ever going to take a job that doesn't have like at least, you know, commission or profit sharing and ideally like stock options or equity. Um, uh, so that was like one thing that was kind of, you know, internal, but it's a great articulation of, um, 
I think accountability and leverage are both like good articulations of ideas that were just kind of like ambiguous before, or like I, I vaguely understood, but couldn't really label or have described as well as, as I can now. Um, and I'm trying to kind of keep exploring those. Um, I mean, the happiness stuff is all kind of like great timeless wisdom that involves just such a good, like synthesizer and distiller that it's like, I feel like, you know, that's 10 philosophy books that you've just kind of like distilled the lessons of and like has, has made it easy for us to kind of get our heads around. Um, so, I mean, uh, I'm probably guilty of like having turned a lot of the Navalisms into my own at this point and like map them to my own things. And, um, I mean, as soon as the book came out and it's, it is a, you guys probably know this better than I do, but I'm new to the feeling of like waking up and having sold a hundred books in my sleep. And like, that is addicting and awesome. And, um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, there's a, I'm definitely kind of like appreciating more of that and like, um, you know, pushing more of that forward and trying to kind of, um, I, I have some like tendencies that are anti-leverage, which are like, uh, a little, not micromanagey, but like self-sufficiency oriented. Like I spent a lot of my career trying to like learn enough of everything to be able to do it all myself instead of like learning how to put the, all the right pieces together, like hire the right designer or the right assistant or whatever. And I just kind of like try to do everything myself instead of put the pieces together, transformer style. Um, so I'm trying to kind of push in that direction more and more and like get more of that leverage. So, cause that's how you get more of your ideas out there and build more things faster. Right. Definitely. I've been thinking about you actually lately with your tweets as being like the, the king of leverage. And I don't mean that in like the eighties finance sense, but in, the, in the sense of like, uh, you know, you all, you've been tweeting, I think at least a lot about, uh, I, I, there's so many good ones, but there was like, you know, I think you even said, um, you don't have enough or you have enough time. You don't have enough leverage. I think was one I saw recently that I really liked. Uh, and these are, I mean, these are all, I mean, there's, you probably have dozens of these, but uh, for me, at least they're really good reminder. Cause I'm kind of, I think I have a similar tendency as you, what you are just talking about where it's like a, you, you kind of want to be good enough at all the different skills and instead you, your time might be better off uh, getting good at putting the pieces together. Mm-hmm. And because those are not necessarily trivial, like hiring the right person is a skill as in itself. Um, even using something like Upwork is a skill, honestly, like it's not, uh, yeah, it's not like you just go on there and somebody can read your brain and find out exactly what you want. And you know, you get the right one. It's a trial and error process to skill you learn over time. And, uh, if you never do it, you're never going to get good at that either. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I'm kind of guilty of the same thing. And so I've been using your tweets as like constant reminders to myself of, uh, of just kind of like try to look for the leverage where, where you can, cool. Uh, that reminds me of like something Nat said recently of like people, oftentimes people tweet things that are kind of like reminders to themselves. For sure. Awesome. Yeah, uh, I why. didn't know you had that tendency. Well, I write before. anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's such a good point though, because it's easy to see somebody, somebody tweeting about something and be like, Oh, they're a master at that. Right. And like more often, if you think about when you tweet things yourself, it's like more like you're kind of writing to yourself, but you want other people to see it. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's usually so. the things that you're like most, like insecure about or unsure about or trying to figure out right it's like that at least for me anyway that's usually what i'm writing or tweeting about it's like i'm gonna workshop this idea in public and kind of see what right. happens from it which yeah if you're, if you're wrong twitter too, tells but, you right away yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it turns out that you're always wrong about everything <laughs> yeah <laughs> yep <laughs> There's always the actually person in the replies. Yeah, right? actually. Yeah. <laughs> actually. I, yeah, I, I, it's bad too because I like have fun fighting with people on Twitter. It's not a healthy habit to have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, we brought this up, Eric, in the episode. I wonder if you got any insight of this during all your Naval research, but like it's the amount of activity he has on Twitter compared to his mindset, it's impressive. Like normally, at least for me, I find. I can get a nice mental break by taking a break from Twitter. And like those yeah. things are correlated. Like I'll <laughs> I get energy sense. from Twitter for sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I definitely get energized from Twitter, but I also get stressed out from Twitter. Like honestly, you know, just not even my own conversations, just seeing other people's convers. Like I'll just see something. I'll be like, I really want to respond, but I don't want to be that guy in the replies. So I'm just going to skip it. But that causes some stress. You see Naval and he's not one of those people who just tweets and then never responds to people. Like he, definitely responds, likes comments, uh, retweets stuff. Like he's reading the replies. Uh, 
I mean, did you get any insight into like how he's managing that or is he just that Zen that it just doesn't affect him? <laughs> I, I, I think it's probably, um, he's probably got pretty thick skin at this point, right? Like yeah. on your way to a million followers, like you probably pretty much see it all. And, yeah. you know, it's gotta be a very conscious choice from him to like keep doing this. Um, and he's got to get more than he, you know, um, benefit from it than he gives up. I imagine it's, you know, um, from his perch, it's probably tough to like actually, you know, rattle him that much. Like you've got to be quite a secure person. I would think in most, yeah. you know, at least yeah. to, uh, you know, relative to a pseudonymous Twitter account telling him that he's wrong. He's like, well, yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> yeah. So That's so, a really good point. So, yeah, I don't know. It is interesting. Um, I, I haven't, I haven't looked actually at the like usage pattern. Um, I, I, I'm trying to remember if he like took a break for a while um, from Twitter and maybe like intentionally came back or something at somewhere in the past and like um, something like that might be interesting. But yeah, I, I know. I also know that like he doesn't follow anybody. He only uses lists right. and like it's a pretty yep. careful curation and um, stuff like that. But I do, you know, I know that he is, there are accounts that he is like favored and kind of, um, you know, I mean, like any of the rest of us, like there's downsides, but there's also got to be great upside. And we, we are kind of, um, actually, if you think about like what it might be like to like be Naval and like, it's probably hard to have a, like, Hey, let's just have a normal, like one-on-one -on -one conversation where like, you tell me your unfiltered thoughts instead of like, just this weird kind of power dynamic where like someone's trying to get something from him or investment or something like that. Like it's much easier for us to find unfiltered thoughts and Twitter might be a great place for him to like have that outlet um, or at least be able to see it without, um, you know, having that weird kind of social dynamic there. That's a good point. Yeah. I can yeah. see that. So how much, uh, how much like direct contact with him did you have while writing the book? Was he like decently involved in giving any feedback or what did that look like? I mean, he, was, he was super responsive, um, but it wasn't a lot of back and forth, really. Like, um, you know, we never talked live. It was all like email and Twitter DMs. Um, cool. And I would just kind of be like, hey, like we basically have reached another milestone here. Like, here's the, here's the manuscript as is. Like, here are my intended next steps. Um, and he was kind of like, cool. Um, <laughs> and then, and like, you'd go another six months and I'm like, and then I started the 600 page version. He's like, wow, you were thorough. Um, and I was like, <laughs> Yeah, we're gonna do some editing. Um, don't worry. Uh, but yeah, he's like supportive and helpful. But um, you know, it's not like we were line editing shit together and um, or anything like that. Nivi yeah. was also helpful, giving some amazing like writing feedback. You know, he's the one who wrote most of Venture Hacks, and he's um, he's an exceptional writer and um, give give great feedback about like making the book fractal um, was was one of his ideas. And so the, the fact that the like table of contents reads like a summary of the book and then that the tweets are very deliberately like representative of the copy around them. And then that the copy, you know, the, the body of the book, uh, represents the main ideas, but if you want to go deeper, you can go into the recommended reading. So there's kind of like four different levels to engage. And if for somebody's read the book a few times, or even they're super familiar with Naval's ideas, like, you know, just flip open the table of contents and you're kind of like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the checklist or that's my, you know, those are my reminders. Um, and if you want to go a little bit deeper, you can you know, thumb through the pages and just read it like a book of aphorisms and scan for the tweets that are, you know, like jogging your memory that are, you know, pretty well curated and probably more, uh, you know, less noisy than going back to Twitter for your next dose of inspiration. That's yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. What, What's, since you were already uh, pretty, f Oh, sorry, Nat. Oh, go ahead, Neil. Okay, I was just going to say this. You guys need like flags or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, this is where doing it live is like easier from that perspective. Uh, yeah. You know, you, know, you don't in have person. to worry about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in, try, yeah, in person, I meant. Um, yeah, I was just, I was just going to say like, since you were already familiar with the, with his ideas for the most part, and you'd, you know, you'd been looking at them for, for a number of years already. Were there, was there anything that popped up that you were surprised by or that you were like, Oh, I didn't remember that he talked about that. Or I didn't know that he, you know, had all this content about that. Oh was yeah. It? yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think like, um, I think absolutely anything is, is interesting if you study it deeply enough, like you could, you can make your entire career out of studying like your cup of green tea. Right. And like go all the way through the supply chain and all the different farmers and all the different people. And like, there, there is no topic that like does not get more interesting the more time you spend with it. Um, 
And so, I, I mean, that was what kind of kept me good. Like three years sounds like a lot of work, but it, it was not a slog. Like I loved doing this and reading these ideas and, um, you know, there's enough of them and enough variety that, um, and it was applicable enough for, for me and what I was doing that, you know, this is happy time. It's like my hobby, I, like going to my, my little like workshop and like, you know, revisit these ideas and figure out how they fit together in new ways. And, um, you know, some of these things take a long time and a lot of repetition to like get into your head in a meaningful, productive way until they're like in your bones and reflexes and you've really like hung them on your own experiences and made them your own. Um, you know, there, there's no, there's no limit on the number of times that it's good to remind yourself that like happiness is a choice and a skill, you know? Um, so that, that is almost always a good reminder that never seems to be top of mind when you need it. Uh, but it's always yeah. good, to, good to read. I right? like, yeah, funny um, how that works. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So much of it is just, is evergreen stuff. And, um, you know, there's just so much source material. And so, um, that is so applicable to like almost any problem, right? A lot of this is like very principle level stuff that, that whatever I was working on at the time or thinking about or whatever problem I had, like, you know, one of those keys kind of did something to help me move that along. That's great. What do you, uh, what was your favorite section that you had to cut from the book? Your favorite topic you had to cut from the book? Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, for for me it was education. Um, oh. I loved his kind of like his take on education and the future of education, and uh, like some of those hot takes were were really interesting to me. Um, Let's talk about those now. Like, what are yeah, some yeah. of those? Why those got cut? They were less evergreen, or it was it was a little less evergreen, and it was a little more. Um, it's just like not universally uh, as appealing to people. I think like not everybody cares about education. Like to to me, it's interesting because I think education, you know, education and like fundamental science are the two most high leverage ways to like improve the condition of humanity over multiple generations. Right. Um, So I'm, I'm like very interested in how we can level up education, the effectiveness and all of those things. Um, And so he's got kind of like, um, you know, it, the section's up on the website now, so people can kind of like cruise, cruise it and um, read it there. And it, it hurt a lot URL? less to cut once I read uh, navalmanac.com cool. slash education should forward there. Um, it might be, it, you might have to click on secret sections to get there, but um, there's basically like, you know, here's a breakdown of all the things that are, you know, the ways that the industrial educational system is generally flawed or like the history that it came from and why it doesn't apply um, as much to where we're going in the future. Uh, and there's also, you know, kind of his takes on like what should and shouldn't, uh, I think the question was like, what would be taught in Naval university? Right. And he's like, you know, a lot of the things that we'd be familiar with from the books, but he's like, I teach persuasion. I teach basic math. I teach physics. I would teach, you know, I'd have the kids like open up a lemonade stand right away. I'd have them start doing like experiment, physical experiments right away to like get the sense of, you know, how the real world responds. Um, you know, math would be much more focused on statistics and probabilities than, calculus because calculus is pretty like specific career driven whereas probability and statistics is much more like makes you literate in reading scientific papers and understanding you know survey results or possible outcomes or something like that um interestingly i think one of the maybe more controversial ones is he's like i think you could totally drop geography and totally drop um history from the curriculum, yeah. like you have to push something out to make room for yeah, some of these other things. And that. like shit's Googleable now. Um, yeah. so like you don't have to memorize it, anything memorizable, just like push it out, teach kids to use Google, um, that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, it's, you don't have to agree with everything in there. And like some of it is kind of off the cuff, like stuff from him, but it's very, it is interesting just as a catalyst for like, you know, his takes are always extreme enough that you have one reaction or another. You're like, I either love that or I hate it, but it makes you think of your own stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Uh, yeah. It's also, I mean, I guess maybe that'd be controversial with some people, but it does tie into a lot of the other things that he talks about. Mm-hmm. Like um, I think maybe this made it into the book or maybe this is, you know, I'm not sure what I'm conflating here or if this is just on his Twitter account, but how uh, like in the future, the the best teacher can teach basically everybody about that topic was that in the book or was that in was just that him tweeting about something i think that was him tweeting and i think it's in the i think it's in the future of education thing i mean i think i mean that's you know fits right into the like the leverage from digital products that we're talking about and and stuff i was just talking to somebody about this today like i think we're going to see this huge boom in online courses in the next like 10 20 years and i think I, i mean i think we'll see a course creating billionaire in the next decade and i think we'll see um my, my, I think my maybe the most bullish is like 
more will get spent on online courses in 20 years than is on all of higher education um, in, in that 20 years. So like, I just think increasingly like these people are so much more motivated and have so much more skin in the game to be like direct teachers and drive outcomes for students than universities are and, and teachers are. Um, especially when you get to like chunking out the kind of like career prep things, um, which we're unbundling now, right? Like you, it's harder to replace a liberal arts degree. Um, but also like there's, you know, great books online program that, does a lot of that now. Um, yeah. and you can kind of do like the St. John's great reading program for 50 bucks a month with like a great group of people from all around the world digitally. And like, that is super, super cool. Um, and I think the other part of it is like the, the like continuing education piece as well. Like there's mm-hmm. a ridiculous amount of money that's spent post like joining a company on trainings and you're probably not getting, you know, trained by the best of the best. Whereas, you know, as we're just talking, like the best person at SEO, hint, hint, I uh, can now teach everybody about SEO or the best person at, at Rome can teach everybody about Rome. Right. <laughs> yep. And so, um, so there's like, there's, a, there's like that, there's like that leverage now. Right. Whereas before it'd be, okay, we got to hire this like corporate trainer, come into the office, do a workshop. Uh, and you know, maybe it's the company that we already had a contract with. That's not the best person in the world at that thing. Um, or yeah. it's like, it, or it's like an executive education course at a, at a university, which, um, and I think I want to go back to one thing that you said, which is like, more money will be spent on these courses than all the money spent on higher ed. Like I think in aggregate that's true, but things will be cheaper for individual people, more mm-hmm. accessible for individual yeah. people. And I think that's a really cool combo. Yeah. This, uh, this screenshot that I, the screenshot I shared in the chat is one that, uh, Encore Nogpal, the founder of teachable posted on Twitter, uh, mm-hmm. like a week or two ago. And that was the, the traffic surge to all teachable schools the week that like the lockdown mm. started like they're basically like yep. online education oh. doubled in the span of a week, which is pretty incredible to see. And now he's, he was saying something about they had like four or five creators do over a million dollars in revenue in Q4, I think of this year. So like wow. just in those three months did over a million and uh, Tiago founder of building a second brain. He, he shared this publicly too. He did like, 968,000 in sales for his latest cohort of building a second brain. And like he did wow. that much in sales over the course of a week, <laughs> like from Monday to Sunday oh. did that much volume. Like it's wild how far like online education has come in just the last year alone. I mean, it, it is, it's wild. It's also crazy that it's taken this long, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. online courses compared to the podcast ecosystem or something like that is like way far behind. Um, I mean, Lambda school is like the most incredible example of this. I think like, you know, they're just straight up replacing a four year degree from a like yeah. career prep standpoint. Um, and they have just like really, infinite really cool. stories. Uh, like Austin's Twitter is so satisfying to follow because mm-hmm. it's like, it feels like almost every yeah. day there's a story of somebody who was making 40 grand a year, went to Lambda for three months, is now making 160 and, you know, yeah. only is ever going to pay Lambda 30 or 40 total. And then after, you know, three or four years, they've made more than they made in their entire life up to that point or something. <laughs> it's pretty wild. Yeah. Dude, so you get this. I got this story in my email um, yesterday. It's like one of the wildest things I've gotten yet. So I've got this uh, course correctly. It's like this baby thing that I have just started that I'm excited about. Um, and this person joined the email list and responded to the welcome email and told me their story. And they're like, live in a developing nation. They're like, I'm in a third world country. I've got a laptop and a light bulb. And like, that's my setup. And I started, you know, three years ago taking online courses. I had just like free YouTubes. Basically I only had $200 in the bank and in six months I had taken courses on e-commerce, applied them and I'd earned $200,000 us. Like he said, he lost it all due to like some tragedy and then immediately started over with like new courses leveled up again in three years, has built it all back up. He's like, this has been like me and online courses in front of a laptop, like in my home, and I was like, so, that is absolutely wild. Like, absolutely so this wild. is, so this is going to be really interesting over the next like 10 to 20 years, maybe even sooner than that. I have no idea, but like, I think people in, in the U S and in, you know, in the Western world in general, not just the U S it, it's going to be tricky 
for people, you know, when they have to compete directly with people with that level of hustle mm-hmm. uh, and with equal skills to them, right? Because that's like the flip side of democratizing education and everybody having access to it, which I think is, is phenomenal. Um, but that's the flip side to it is like your luckiness of being born. I forget who said that, but like, you know, you're lucky if you're born, you're already lucky if you were born in America to a two, par- two parent household. Yeah. And, and like, that's like winning the lottery right there. And, uh, that advantage, maybe the two parent household thing will still be an advantage, but the being born in America thing, I think will be eroded significantly because a lot of the advantage of being born in America was political stability, education, uh, access to things like libraries, that type of stuff, um, and stable infrastructure. And like, yeah, a lot of that is being democratized, which is, I think on aggregate, awesome, but there's going to be some trickiness, I think, in terms of, uh, where the Western world fits, you know, in, in the overall kind of global yeah. system. I mean, I think you're good. now the, the new version of that might be like, you're lucky if you're in a place that you could learn English because then yeah. so much of yeah. this is unlocked for you. Yep. Um, yep. And increasingly like, uh, this is a non nuanced statement, but like there used to be infinitely small markets for education, right? Like you were the local person who taught X and now like there was one market for education. And, and, yep. and that's where those like crazy outcomes are going to come from where the best teacher of math. I mean, we already saw this with Khan Academy a little bit and we see yeah. it. Um, I think Asia is actually like pretty far ahead of us on this because the scale that some of those like incredible tutors get, I mean, they make millions and millions of dollars a year because yep. they are just the best math tutor in China or something like that. And and they reach kind of crazy scale with that stuff. Um, but that is going to, you know, those markets will keep merging. We'll just keep getting bigger and bigger, you know, outcomes. It's going to be You're wild. To- oh, go ahead. Now. <laughs> I was just going to say, you're starting to see some of that even on like TikTok as a platform where Mm -hmm. it started off as like silly dancing videos, but there's actually a lot of educators on it now. And there's some really cool like science or history or whatever accounts that have hundreds of thousands or millions of followers. And if you just like watched their videos, you would learn a ton about history in a much more interesting format than you would get from a textbook and probably be like more memorable and stuff. And one person yeah. making these like handheld iPhone videos, teaching random history facts can reach millions and millions of people on a fun platform. It's like, it's a very crazy new world for and they can be anywhere. education in general. As long as they have as long anywhere. As they have yeah. yeah. Yeah, just just don't take the investing advice from TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, investing TikTok is hilarious. I love it. It's so funny. <laughs> I have to check that out. I feel like I've only seen a couple that I got shared to Twitter. Um, I, I think I, I'm very bullish on TikTok. I'm not going to lie. I really think that it's, it's just like for everything. It's a pretty incredible platform. Um, I, what I was going to say earlier was it's going to be wild when humans are an interplanetary species, like we're all over, all over the, you know, let's say the, at least the solar system and, uh, or maybe further, but we're all speaking English, which is like a legacy of the small Island nation that happened to, you know, have this empire during the 1800s and yeah, we're yeah, speaking English and using and like, using QWERTY keyboards on Jupiter. Yeah. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. But it's all like a legacy of like this 1800s, like or 1700s imperial uh, empire. And that's, and that's and just because of like the timing of that is why we all speak English. If it was like a couple centuries earlier, we'd all be speaking Spanish. If it was, yeah. you know, like, yeah. I don't know. It <laughs> could still be uh, Chinese, I think. It could be. No, it could be. But <laughs> those odds are people, high. Too, like, but that's the thing it's though. true, yeah. Like, yeah, I'm like they're too. at least the people in business there are like, uh, yeah, it's like English is kind of the become the language of business. I mean, it, in, in India, it's like the same way. Like, I mean, India is a little different because they do have like English as the official language from the beginning of the country. But um, it's kind of like if you go to school and if you want to do any kind of like actual career, you have to speak like English is basically the prereq there. And yeah. so that's another billion people <laughs> added <laughs> to the English ecosystem. And China is probably, I don't know what percent of people speak English, but it's got to be 30% at least, maybe more. I mean, definitely the ones living in cities. Yeah, yeah. So it's going to be wild. Like this language, English, it's not American, it's English, right? It's tied to, yeah. <laughs> to this small little island. It's England. It's fine. Uh, but we'll be on Jupiter, yeah, <laughs> on our QWERTY keyboards. So where Eric, does that come were, from, by the way? The QWERTY I don't know keyboard? where that comes from. Yeah, that this, was, is like, uh, this is our first tangent. Oh, I, this is kind of a fun tangent, though. I mean, that was that that keyboard layout was invented so that typewriters wouldn't get jammed. So 
oh, wow. letters <laughs> letters that are often used together are separated so that so that when the keys would hit up they wouldn't hit each other and like break the machine so it's like q and u should be close together but they're on like almost opposite sides right and a lot of the most common letters right like r s t l n e they should be where the like you know d f g h j k are but they're kind of like spread out all over so that you're moving around more um and, and that's why supposedly like dvorak is so much better as a keyboard because it optimizes for you know frequency of letters over you know avoiding jamming so but then you've got to learn an entirely new keyboard layout, which I've tried, not... and it's really fucking hard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it completely breaks your brain. <laughs> you get you get like nerd street cred for trying. I don't know if anybody yeah. who's stuck with it, but I know a lot of people who who tried. Yeah, yeah. Especially now that it's like on every different, you know, it's on phone and keyboard and everything. Or like exactly, like, you know, on your. I don't even know if you can. Like, you could probably download it for a keyboard on your iPhone, but that is an option. Yeah, but. So Eric, if you were going to write another Navalmanac about another famous influencer of thought, who would be next on your list? I've, I've been thinking about this. Um, I'm not sure that I'm leaping into it quite yet, but I, I've been thinking about it at least. Um, I think uh, I think Andreessen would be a good one. I think uh, that Paul. I love Paul Graham's ideas, but I think he's done such a good job with his essays that like you just yeah. be publishing a book of his essays, and that's not like you need to find somebody who's like prolific in like podcasts and media, but not ever going to like write their own book. Right. Um, and I think that my leading candidate right now, um, and this came out when I started asking myself the question of like, who do I want to help, you know, millions more people think like, and like, who do I want to help extend, you know, their ideas into more of humanity? Um, and I think Elon Musk would be a really good one. Yeah. I think you could get a really good, like similar size book of all of Elon's like best ideas and tools for thinking and like, you know, how to break down an idea and find first principles and self-educate and his story is just so interesting. And like, he just so unapologetically like tries to improve things. (laughs) Yeah. And yeah. And just like lives, lives it up. Right. Like, um, yeah, I I admire the just kind of like, you know, guys got to, that's cool. Cause he would never write his own book. Cause he's like, He's yeah. too low leverage for him, right? Yeah, like yeah. On. Yeah, it's uh, not a, not a flamethrower. Get that out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Just like to to be to be operating on that level and to still have the 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 humor to charge sixty nine four twenty for the Model S. Yeah. It's like. <laughs> that's what i love about him yeah i know suffers, it's like so the great. fools and he suffers the fools so well i feel like like he's you know it, it, he could get really annoyed like oh i'm doing this for humanity and this is how humanity is like you know thinking about me because that's what yeah. he says at least um but he just takes it he takes everything so well it takes it with so much like he's having so much fun which is awesome to see uh yeah, yeah. i love it yeah It'd that's a really a good, good idea i like that i like that and he's also his ideas are all over the place too like he's not mm-hmm. um I can't think of like one place I'd go to get all of his ideas, you know, kind of yeah. like Naval. It's very similar yeah. in that same way. Yeah. He's on a There's ton a- of interviews. He's super interesting about like interesting thoughts about education, interesting thoughts about, you know, physics and innovation and business. It, it just feels like he's, you know, writing his own playbook and has, um, I mean, he's got like totally fucking crazy things to say too about all kinds of stuff. So like it'd be, it'd be a lot of, a lot of filtering, lot of but inter- yeah. Yeah. But yeah. you get a lot of like, and he's also well known enough where, uh, and, mm-hmm. you know, you have the name recognition, just like and, with Naval, you have that yeah. as well. And yeah. he's funny. I mean, he's, Naval yeah, or Elon, hilarious. they both are, they both are funny. I don't think Naval gets enough credit for being funny. Um, but <laughs> Elon does. And that, uh, like, yeah, that, that, that makes it fun for me too. I get the sense that Elon's not super happy with the Vance biography too. Plus it came out so long ago. It's like Elon's biggest accomplishments have all happened since that biography came out. Mm. So it's kind of like an interesting I mean, opportunity to do something well, like, that he's actually happy um, with. Yeah, go feel, ahead, Eric. I feel like everybody wants a biographer who does not editorialize, which is me. I'm like I'm like a third party yeah. autobiographer. It's like I'll I'll take yeah. your own words and your own ideas and try to like just get myself out of the way and like help other people understand how you think and how you do what you do We're without honest, like yeah. I'm not I'm not writing about you. I'm not You're evaluating not your anything. life. I'm yeah, not even yeah. like, you know, <laughs> if you want to leave your marriages out of it, leave your marriages out of it. I don't care. Like I just want to help people learn from you. Um right. yeah. well and, and I think your own words. Pro- your focus on the evergreen ideas uh, is, is I think amazing, right? Like, I think that's what will make, 
even for Elon, right? Like we had a whole episode about this, about his first principles thinking idea. And I mean, he didn't come up with that, of course, but Mm -hmm. uh, kind of popularized, oh, maybe popularized it through that Wait But Why article. Yeah, I think Wait But Why popularized it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. but it's his, it's his, uh, well, I guess the example they use was him. I mean, the people who use first principles thinking. But, you know, that's just like one example of like something he uses, he's talked about it and he clearly operates from, um, and that's timeless concept. Like you can use that in 1400. You can use that problem. I mean, as long as humans are around, you can use For sure. that. So yeah, it's, it, it, it's not like a biography in the sense like, oh, we're going to talk about, you know, Tesla or PayPal. I mean, think about it this way. Like PayPal was at the cutting edge, you know, 20 years ago, maybe even earlier than that. And, you know, now, yeah, it's still, it's still a good company. They've done, they've done well, they're still around, but it's not Tesla. Right. And like, right. but then yeah, if you think 20 years in the future, like, <laughs> yeah, it's a footnote. It's like, oh, he was one of the co-founders of this and now it's Tesla. But I wonder 20 years from now, like, is Tesla going to be like a, f- maybe not a footnote, but like the prequel to SpaceX, right? Like if SpaceX Probably. does accomplish a lot of its goals, that's, that's like another level from Tesla even um, if they do get, you know, all the interplanetary stuff that they've talked about. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's very hard to say like, okay, if you're talking about it from an accomplishment standpoint, what will be relevant from a timeless standpoint. Um, but if you're talking about the concepts and the principles, that's going to work, you know, no matter when you're reading the book. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think like Elon is, is, um, I mean, he's like the Tony Stark character, right? He's like yeah. making all this stuff. Like I think about what, you know, would 16 year old me have wanted to read a book about Elon Musk? Like, hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> and, and, and would it have yeah. like maybe made me major in physics and like understand a little bit more like better science than I do today? Like probably like that. And that is really good. Like if, um, if people want to idolize Elon Musk, you know, I feel like a lot of biographies go out to like their journalists and they go out to win a Pulitzer. And so they have to like turn the person into this like tragic figure and dig up all this shit on them. And like, my goal yeah. is just to help people think, you know, how people learn to think and improve themselves by breaking down what these, you know, accomplished people already know or the tools that they use. Yeah, actually, I mean, so this is totally divergent. So Neil, do you have a question related to that? If not, I have a totally divergent question I want to ask. <laughs> uh, no, I think, I think we, that was a good topic. We need to keep talking about that forever. I can't wait till, to yeah. do the, uh, Elon Musk, uh, the, the almanac of Elon Musk. Uh, Muskography. <laughs> interview and in, in whatever the, yeah. We're, we're such like basic, like tech internet dudes. We just like cannot Evolve. get through a podcast <laughs> without talking about Elon Musk. The ball and Elon, <laughs> yeah. Well, we the, haven't the talked about gonna, Bitcoin yet, guys. No. I know, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question I was going to ask here Somebody is, playing a drinking game at home just passed out. Yeah. Uh, we, we've <laughs> talked about that before, the, the made you think drinking game. Like every time we go on a tangent, <laughs> every time the scene to lab comes up. We use the word heuristic. One. Yeah. Heuristic. Oh, yeah. We haven't talked about Teleb yet. I've talked about Teleb, Teleb at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> I am not writing a book about Taleb. Are you kidding me? No oh, way. Man. <laughs> that would be, I was going to yeah, ask. I, I feel like um, he would. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he'd probably try to set you on fire. I don't know. Dude's a character. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, not, I'm not ready to opt into that level yeah. of scrutiny. Yeah, I love his books for what they are. I, I'm not. They are the last things I want to touch as far as yeah. curation goes. <laughs> I can already see the tweets. Bullshit artist, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> I should just make that my Twitter bio now. Just get there you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was going to ask about uh, uh, the Vols, like, relationships. Like, I actually don't. Is he married? Does he have kids? He never talks about it. Yeah, and I, he, I, I he feel like that didn't make kids. it in the book. It doesn't talk about it too much. Yeah. Um, yeah, th- th- there was like a little nod to it in the bio. Um, I mean, like I very understandably, I think he wants to keep his personal life kind of more, more private. Um, there's sense. a little yeah. section on relationships and kind of su- some of the stuff that he shared. That's a very like kind of, um, you know, the evolution, mental mo- evolutionary mental model take on relationships, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, but you know, I, I like, it's probably, um, you know, I get the sense that it's like unique and interesting and works for him. And um, he, I think he got married when he's in his somewhere around 40. Um, so it's just kind of like a little unique in that. And I know that he's got a, at least a son. Um, but yeah, you know, he's, he tries to keep his personal life, you know, more private and just like kind of keep people focused on his ideas. He just tried to keep me like ask 
the the total the bio get removed from the book entirely and i was like ah, really? that, there's too many people who like, just like didn't know enough of the backstory or like um actually tried putting the bio at the end and some of the beta readers i gave the book to were like it's kind of weird that this person I don't know is just like jumping into telling me how to be happy. Um, yeah. And I was like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. I got <laughs> to do the intro a little bit. And even people who like listen to the podcast and like have followed up for years don't, you know, necessarily know the story, uh, you know, know that he was an immigrant, know that he was, you know, single parent household, know that, you know, some of the, some of the challenges he had in like early in his career, um, which is a pretty, you know, there's interesting stories in there for sure. Cool. Yeah. I just, it's kind of interesting. It's, to your point, I didn't know any of that part of his life. He's just, he feels like an idea machine to me. You don't have the whole picture. <laughs> outside. Yeah. 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 I think that makes sense. Um, plus, you know, I, I don't know. You guys read that post from Tim Ferriss about like the, the yeah. downsides of fame downsides or whatever. Fame. Like, Oof. dude, it's a rough yeah. post. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, what was, so yeah, what was getting uh, the, what was getting the forward from Tim? Lodge I was just going to ask that. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Oh, was, I mean, like that had a lot more to do with Naval than with me. You know, there's oh, okay, a zero cool. percent chance that like an Eric Jorgensen original would have had a Tim Ferriss forward. Um, so I just, <laughs> uh, you know, I had a lot of proof of work, and I asked Naval politely if he would ask, and he did. And I had no expectations, but um, but it worked out. And and you know, Tim wrote a great forward, and I'm super grateful for you know, his, his contribution, I think it lends a lot of credibility. I mean, people, he's, he's super meticulous about the stuff that he gets involved in and so he'd never write a foreword. And so like, you right. know, everything that we did to make the book free, you know, that was a huge condition for him. Um, and you know, I mean, there's, you know, there's not even an email capture, right. On, on like getting any of the free full versions of the book. So like, um, you know, it was very much a public service kind of from the beginning. And that's kind of the, you know, I think what let him feel like it was cool to be a part of it without, you know, breaking his, his no, his no forward oath. Yeah. Do you know why he has that? I was just curious. Cause I, uh, I mean, I know he's written a couple of a bunch, I think in the past. I has he, the only one I know of was, um, or maybe one, at least I know of for sure. Uh, is somebody, I, I, I didn't know about it until after my book came out, but he, somebody told me that vagabonding was, yeah, um, yeah. was written by him. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that no, I imagine it's just that if he, he bought the it rights. might be just the precedent. Oh, he yeah. owns the rights to that? Interesting. I didn't even know yeah. that. Oh, yeah, I didn't either. Because um, yeah, I heard about it through him, right? Like, I didn't even know about that book before, but uh, it's a good I, mean, I, I good believe, book, yeah. I know he owns the rights to the audio book. I think he bought the rights to the print book as well and then helped republish it and helped get the audio book made. And I think that's when he wrote the foreword to it. But there should be like a secondary marketplace. This is another tangent. But there should be a secondary marketplace for like older books that are. Uh, you know, that the rights are, are out there and aren't really making yeah. any money for marketers who like think they can, or maybe they really mm -hmm. resonate with the ideas. They want to get them out there. Like that'd be an interesting, uh, I mean, I know publishers own a lot of the rights, so that'd be the tricky part, but I feel like if you went to a publisher, you're like, Hey, you guys have made $0 off this book for five years. We'll pay you $5,000 for it. And now it's our rights. Uh, maybe they do it. Yeah. yeah. I exist for music. So Yeah. Yeah. You probably could, you'd probably have to like, I think, you know, hustle it up yourself, but I think that's a totally legit. I mean, there's a ton of agents out there, like, you know, I'm working with a foreign rights agent now and it's, it's, you know, just people with, you know, little contracts calling each other, making shit happen. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah no reason you can't. Yeah. I mean, stuff like the systems Bible, right. I mean, like that's what Stripe press is doing. I don't know if they're buying rights, but they're definitely like helping kind of resurrect some of these like great classics that they love that were just not, you know, um, that are out of print or whatever that you can, only, you know, that like four hundred dollars on eBay or whatever. Now, yeah, it's a great idea that they're that they're doing that. I've seen some of their stuff. Mm -hmm. They're beautiful books yeah. too, because of course they are. Because Stripe rocks at everything. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. So what's next? What's the next big project? Or are you just enjoying being done well, with you, this for a little bit? Yeah, Eric, you mentioned the course thing that you're doing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's. Um, I mean, it's a uh, in, informal kind of like early stage, I think. But um, I'm, I'm, I mean, I th this idea of leverage is just like so interesting to me and so explanatory. I think like that's what I'm diving into now. So um, that's that's why I'm tweeting randomly about leverage at all times of night because like that's where <laughs> that's like um, 
the game I'm playing on the ceiling. Um, so I'm thinking about that. And I think like, you know, Naval did us a great favor by just kind of like slapping a label on it and creating like big buckets. But I think there's so much more to kind of explore and flesh out those ideas. And, um, you know, it leverages the definitely the most, the idea that I get the most like e- emails or DMs about that's like, hey, I get that this is important, but like, uh, I don't know how to apply it. Help me. <laughs> um, yeah. And so like taking some of those next steps, like closing the gap between, you know, like some of the people I talk to, like, uh, I think now you're like, have definitely fallen into this camp of like having intuited your way into it and be like, you know, you, you do it and it feels good. And you're like, Oh, that was awesome. I want to do more of that. Um, yeah. and, and you know, it's, it's a part of, frankly, it's a part of like four hour work week. Um, you know, it, Ray Dalio talks about it in principles. It like this idea exists under a lot of different names, but like classifying it and creating like one kind of, um, holistic framework for it and building a metaphor around it. And then kind of a set of tactics and tools and triaging like questions and frameworks. I think, um, that's what I'm kind of working on. And I just uh, talked to somebody today and I'm just kind of like getting in this habit of like, you know, I get on a call with somebody and they're like, Hey, I have this problem and I'm like stuck in my business. I'm kind of like, cool. Let me like try out these rickety little duct tape frameworks that I'm working on. Um, and they're like getting better and they're getting to the point where like to actually help people think through things and like figure out what their clear next step is and how to like apply leverage to the problem or find their bottleneck and their growth because of it. So, um, yeah, that'll be, that'll come out. I think sometime, um, you know, 2021, but I'm, I've never built a course before. So I'm kind of learning the medium and exploring this new idea at the same time. And that's my, like, you know, that's where my, my energy's going. Um, it's gotta be something, something in like the gestalt around that right now, because that's been very heavily on my mind too. And I've been like workshopping Mm -hmm. an article on, it sounds like very similar topics in the background too, right around like, okay, personal leverage is super important, but if it's not already intuitive to you, how do you start to like develop a process around it? How do you remind yourself that you're not doing it in the moments when it feels like you have to be doing everything? Like Mm -hmm. how do you, you know, continually systematize yourself out of operating on stuff, right? It's like, it's such an interesting question. And I think it's like understanding that cycle is kind of the core of a lot of entrepreneurship and business building in general. It's like the faster you can identify a problem, define the solution, refine the steps, automate or delegate it, and then move on to the next problem. Just like the faster Mm -hmm. you're going to grow in almost any area. Um, So that's like a really cool thing to be working on. sounds very interesting. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm excited to read your article. Um, I've been just digging for, there's a great stuff. I mean, Oren Hoffman has done some really cool posts about this um, recently. I mean, even if you go back to like, um, you know, Andy Grove talks about managerial leverage, right? And yeah, it's like, yeah. what is what is your output as a function of your headcount, you know, the output of your team and the teams around you. And so there's like, you know, there's people talking about it at, at a managerial level, at a personal level, and, and even at a company level, you know, so we're seeing like the, company leverage where you see, you know, acquisition price overhead count kind of go up dramatically. Right. So you like, you know, WhatsApp after Instagram, after, you know, some of these other things. And it's like a crazy, yeah, um, I think some metrics are being decoupled, right. It's like yeah. not tied to, I remember even the Instagram one, like it was 13 people or something right at the time. Yeah. Almost hundred hundred million dollars per person. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and that sounds crazy, but it's not, I mean, it's, it's not right. And, but it's, it's easy to, um, what's the right way to put this? Like it's it, when you see an acquisition like that, it's easy to like laugh and be like, Oh, that's so stupid. But now it's like the exact opposite. Right. If you look at the, yeah. how well that yeah. turned out for, for, for Facebook, but it's because they weren't buying the employees. Like, and that's the difference between what it, it used to be that like the employees were almost like a proxy for how productive the company is. It's like, Oh, it's a thousand person company. It's a 500 person company. How many people do you manage? Right. And like, that isn't really, I actually view it the opposite way now. Right. It's like, yeah. it, it, if you tell me you have a hundred employees or a thousand employees, like I'm doing the back of the envelope math of like, is this company making any money or is yeah, it like, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's an e-commerce company I've been doing a little bit of work with and they, um, they're the guy who, who the, the person I work directly with, who's the, uh, co-founder and CRO, like he, uh, he has a max headcount goal for the company of a hundred. They're like mm-hmm. 70 people right now. And he's like, we are never going to be over a hundred people. Cause we, no, it's three founders. He's like, we never want to manage over a hundred people and yep. we have to oh manage God. everything under that hundred person headcount. And that, I don't know if they'll ever break, you know, he'll ever break his rule or not. They haven't gotten to that point, but having that mental model 
it has forced them to be super, super efficient. Like they are doing, mm-hmm. I think, 35 million in revenue uh, for this year. So that's pretty solid for like a 70 person 70 company. people, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. some of those 70 people are like warehouse people. Like they're counting mm-hmm. that under the head count. So a lot of the stuff he's like, we basically like they have, you wouldn't expect like an e-commerce company. To, I mean, some of them do obviously have a uh, significant investment in like software. And he's like, if I have to spend a bunch of money one time to never have to hire for a certain function, like I'm definitely going to do Huge. that. Um, so yeah, th- the way they're thinking about it is very different than you would think about like, you know, a retail company in the past, right? Like in the past, you'd probably think about like number of locations and, you know, number of people, like people matter a lot more in that sense. But thinking about it, I think, what was the metric you just used? Was it revenue over headcount or something? Uh, I mean, acquisition those, price. Yeah. Acquisition those examples price are acquisition revenue. price. But you yeah, use market yeah. cap, you could use revenue, you could use profit. Like it is just kind of signals different if, things. I, and those metrics aren't that widely available yet. I mean, I feel like that if that was more in the public eye, maybe, uh, you know, people use market cap, right. As like such an yeah. easy metric to compare companies. Yeah, I know yeah. Nat has, Nat has a lot of opinions on market cap. <laughs> uh, <laughs> only but, for uh, crypto yeah. Only, oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah crypto market cap is a fucking joke but <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but i feel yeah. like if we had those metrics more available like okay this company has you know a million dollars per employee or this company has three hundred thousand per employee it's an easy it's a it'll make it a little easier to compare like the relative leverage i yeah. guess different yeah. business could, models somebody could run that on public companies pretty easily i mean i think those are standardized yeah. um yeah. I, I remember reading that craigslist had you know 10 million revenue per employee or something like that. It yeah. was crazy high because there were 30 employees and hundreds of million in revenue for, for a while there. I don't know if that's still true. Um, power of software. Yeah. 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 Software and media. I mean, to, to the point of the book, right. It's like Naval says that over and over again, it's like you either get good in software or get good in media because it's like, as soon as you have to add more people to solve the problem, your ability to like get to crazy levels of scale diminishes. So yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot of, um, I, I just did that like thread on people leverage. I think there's like, you know, he, he throws it under the bus. I think there's like huge synergies to working with a small team of complementary skills. Um, yeah. and you need to broaden that a little bit because there's also huge leverage in having, you know, a strong audience or strong vendor relationships or things like that, where it's like not necessarily headcount. Um, but you are still like relying on, I mean, building a community or an open source community or something like that is, um, you know, it is leveraged similarly, but it is different than employee headcount. Um, so there's a lot of ways to kind of achieve that. Definitely. Well, uh, Eric, so if people want to get the book, obviously they should go to Amazon. Anywhere else that you want to send people to connect with you and everything that you're working on? Uh, I'm on Twitter like all the damn time, like too much. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm easy to find. On, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm easy to find on Twitter. Navalmanac.com is all the, all the, um, you know, book stuff and ton of stuff that didn't make it to the final version. Uh, we got an audio book coming out uh, pretty soon in, in oh, January sweet. here. So that's, um, we're working on that. Are you reading it or did you get someone else to read it? No, we got a pro. Um, cool. Got a pro. I remember I've heard, heard some other authors read their own. Um, and I was like, yeah, we're going to get a pro. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's good. Trying to get that leverage, right? Get the, get the yeah. experts doing, doing their jobs. Um, Feel that. Yeah, we're doing, uh, just kicked off, uh, with our first book club in January. Um, so if that goes well, we'll do more of them. If it doesn't like, Sweet. you know, no biggie, um, going to keep working on this course. Ejorgensen.com is all my like personal stuff. So I just keep a very random writing schedule there. But, um, and I think that's where we'll do the course too. So Sweet. But yeah, I'm easy to find. Come, oh. come at me. We'll have all that linked in the show notes. So Eric, thank you again for joining for this episode of made you think. And uh, good luck with everything that's coming up. And everyone listening, make sure you go pick up a copy of the book.